the longest war in American history is set to end. US troops will leave Afghanistan by... As NATO forces prepared to withdraw the final troops from Afghanistan in 2021, after two decades, the Taliban began to advance rapidly, taking city after city, province after province. Their goal, the capital, Kabul. Breaking news and Taliban fighters have arrived at the Afghan capital, Kabul. The, Taliban... the speed was remarkable, not just to the millions of Afghans whose lives were about to fundamentally change, but also across the world, to governments watching from their capitals and to journalists like myself, sent to report. I hear a lot of shouting uh, coming down the road behind me. In fact, I think it's a procession of, uh, of the Taliban. Uh, yes, it is. They're in their shawar kameez. They're led by uh, a white flag um, and uh, they're chanting as they go, go down. I'm Sky News Chief Correspondent Stuart Ramsey and I was reporting with my team from Kabul when on August the 15th it fell to the Taliban. Gunfire followed by people running. Police vehicles suddenly appearing on the streets. Anti-missile systems firing chaff into the air. Chaos descended on Kabul. Thousands fled to the airport, desperate to get out. Western governments had promised sanctuary to people who had helped their efforts against the Taliban, but in the chaos, getting out became in itself deadly. Many had to make painful, life-changing decisions, and they all have their own story to tell. They told me, your son is in, in here, your daughter is not in here. And my wife, she was crying, my daughter, I lost my daughter. Even now, when I'm alone at home, and when I remember the airport and the coming, even night time, when I go to bed and I couldn't sleep that time, it was really hard for us. Over two weeks, more than 15,000 people were evacuated from Afghanistan to the UK. More than 105,000 went to other countries, and many others were left behind. So what happened next? In this series, we hear the stories of some of those who were evacuated to the UK, their struggle to make it through Kabul airport, what they left behind, and 12 months on, where they are now. This is Out of Afghanistan for Sky News. Some of those who have spoken to us have asked us to change their names. They're understandably concerned for the safety of their families still in Afghanistan. But they do want their stories to be told. We start with a family who had no idea they were about to get caught in the mayhem. My name is uh, Yusuf Khan. I'm 43 years old and I'm originally from Afghanistan. And I'm a British citizen. My name is Shirbano and uh, I am 35 years old and uh, I'm a British citizen. My name is Malale. I'm 10 years old. I was born in Afghanistan, but uh, I was here in uh, 2001. Uh, I was uh, as a asylum seeker. It was the same time uh, the Taliban was there. So then the young generation just only have two choices, to join them or run away. After um, we met and we married, uh, and then we moved to Leicester for some time. And uh, in 2017, we uh, just saw that uh, we missed our family and uh, the life of Afghanistan, so we decided to go there instead. We were just uh, staying normal life there with the joint family with my other brothers. My daughter was going to school. Even though Yusuf was happy living with family, after four years, he felt life in Afghanistan was becoming increasingly risky. It seems like uh, you, you were not safe. The Taliban would have picked you up or ask you for money or saying, we know that you are British, we are okay with you, but you have to donate that much money to this section. Also, the other criminals, if they knew that you are from UK or other places. It's happened with a lot of people, which I know, that being kidnapped and asked for ransom of uh, 500,000 or 600,000 pounds. And some of them being killed as well. He decided they should return to the UK. I told them that I will leave because uh, I was the head of the family and the risk is uh, more to me 
and then told her I'll go to UK and find a place and then you both can come as well. And then I, I came on normal flight on 14th. The plane Yusuf was on turned out to be one of the last commercial flights out of Kabul airport. I was fine that time when uh, my husband came to UK. On that day, we couldn't see that uh, the situation will get that worse. And then uh, on 15th of August, when I see the news, everything was saying, oh, that city has been uh, captured by Taliban, this city, that city, and uh, I was worried. This is Sky News at 11, the headlines. Breaking news, the Taliban reach Afghanistan's capital, Kabul, and say they want... The Taliban's strategy of targeting police and military compounds and cities in different parts of Afghanistan on an almost day-to-day -day basis completely overwhelmed the security forces' ability to defend themselves. Bit by bit, those forces collapsed. The Taliban claim Kabul 20 years after they were targeted by the West. Hardliners returned to the streets of the capital of Afghanistan. I think Residents like Shabano, who'd been preparing Sunday lunch, were utterly stunned at what was happening. We were sitting and doing the lunch, there was like suddenly firing. Everyone was saying the Taliban came to Kabul and there was like a um, police station. When we saw, the, yeah, there was Taliban. We was guest in our cousin's home. My cousin's home is here, and our is here. Here's a police station in the middle. Uh, when we go to there, then everything was fine. When we go back to our home, then it was Taliban. Suddenly everything changed. There was a lot of news, but we, were, we didn't see the news. We were just seeing everything live. It was so close to our home, the police station. The police, the police, they take uh, their costumes, and there was so much, and the whole people ran, uh, ran off them. The Taliban took over everything, from government buildings to checkpoints and military vehicles, often found abandoned. Social media was overwhelmed by videos of the Taliban taking control and celebrating. When they take the police station, then they was happy, then they firing. Then we were scared. And then I messaged him. At that time he was sleeping, I think he was quarantined. I told him there is like Taliban enter to Kabul. And he also saw in the news as well. And I was worried and I called the home office here. And they say we'll call, oh, they already issue a warning about Afghanistan. American, British and other international forces have been arriving at the airport for days, evacuating embassy staff. As the Taliban breached the gates of the capital, tens of thousands of Afghans headed for the airport complex. Soon, all roads were jammed. People were terrified and desperate to leave. Over the coming days, that desperation saw people attempting to cling to the wings and fuselage of transporter planes. Some held on until after takeoff, but then fell to their deaths on the runway below. Some did have a right to leave, but thousands more tried to join this evacuation that turned more chaotic as each day passed. And I waited about two days. And on that night, uh, like 10.30, they called me and said, you can go to the airport. But it was late night, and after 10, we can't go out. And also, the situation was totally not safe. And all night, I didn't sleep because I didn't know what to do and how to go and how to find the way. And everyone was telling me there is a lot, very rush and very, a lot of people, you couldn't go there. And also, the Taliban, they do firing and shooting. When we was thinking, might be we will go to UK or we might be killed in the airport. Shabano's fear was well founded. Extra troops had been flown in to help with the chaotic evacuation, but the deadline to leave was ticking away. Troops had to be out of the country by August the 31st. 
Thousands of people are leaving Afghanistan every day. Reports this morning say UK flights may well stop by the end of the week. As Shabana braced herself for what she might face at the airport, there were many others who found themselves in the same predicament. People like Avza, a 35-year-old who had joined the military as a teenager. I was a soldier, but uh, we was working with the British soldier. 2020, and I started job as a training wing officer with the Afghan NPPF, National Protective Police Force. Our mission in Afghanistan was never supposed to have been nation-building. It was never supposed to be creating a unified, centralized democracy. When the Biden told we go out from Afghanistan and the other country as well, we no believe the NATO go out because if the Taliban control the Afghanistan, they will do badness the same like before 2000. In April 2021, after the withdrawal was announced, the British government opened a resettlement scheme. It's called the Afghan Relocations and Assistance Policy to give safe passage for the staff and families of those who work for the government or the British military and support to resettle in the UK. Asal had applied, but like many others, he didn't yet have a passport and he didn't think the Taliban would actually win. When they left the Bagram airport, it shocked us a little to understand it's happened. It, the NATO will go out. He went to collect his passport on the worst possible day, August the 15th. When I go to the passport office, on that day, the Afghanistan fall down. <laughs> yeah, it was happened like this, but we no believe before that. He got caught in the Taliban's takeover of the city. We come out from unit and I, on the radio, I hear it, some province fall down. When we come to maybe two or three kilometers, the road is closed and the people escape from one side of Kabul and all of them, they want to come to another side of Kabul. 10 o'clock up to 5 o'clock, I was stuck on there. The Afghan National Army and police was finished. And the unit was in, inside the Kabul. <laughs> it was surrounded by, by the Taliban as well, same like my unit. My wife, she called me, where is you, where is you, where is you? Back with Shabano, who we'd heard from earlier, she's had a sleepless night. She, along with her daughter and 17-year-old nephew, are preparing to leave Afghanistan, perhaps for good. I wear like normal um, abaya, which we wear in our country, but our friend, they were going to airport. They said there is very rush and you have to wear like short clothes, not a big one. There will be like pushing and pulling everything. When I spoke to the home office, they told me that you can't take any luggage with you, just like um, one small hand luggage. So I put my daughter Malala's um, one clothes, yeah, because uh, we didn't know. And also I took my nephew and he didn't take anything, any clothes, because we were very shocked in that time. I have so many things like school things and my cousin likes to then I give her everything morning we come out from our home and we just leave our home we didn't take anything from there we just even we didn't close it we call our relative that they will come and see if they need something i miss my home now my grandma was crying as she was crying um, we hugged and like go <laughs> yeah When we went to the airport, there was a lot of like thousand, thousand people. There was like Taliban and they were shooting. Yeah, the situation was very bad, so they had to stop everybody entering to the airports. Shibano and the children were trying to reach the Baron Hotel where the British had set up their processing operations. And this hotel was now protected by the parachute regiment. The complex, which looks like a military base, is reached by a narrow road that runs along the side of the airport wall. 
The paras have placed two shipping containers in a V shape at the entrance to try and control the movement of the crowd. But the Taliban had also set up checkpoints along the entire length of the airport road. The paratroopers now found themselves face to face with the Taliban, the very people they'd been fighting for two decades. At the same time, they tried to deal with thousands upon thousands of people. People was crashing. When we were there, the four people, they died. I saw one of them, they put white clothes on it and they took it to um, take them outside. The desperation and fear came in waves. The crowd became agitated. Some people at the front were simply crushed to death. The heat was intolerable and there was no water. Many could be seen being beaten by the Taliban. We were scaring from the people and we were trying to keep ourselves safe, but we were coming more out from the airport and the people was trying to go in. Even about five hours we were staying there, we didn't move about one meter. Even my daughter, she was scaring from the firing and she said, I don't want to go and I want to stay back in Kabul because they will kill us. The Taliban, even on the top of the barrier walls, they said, if you moved, I will shoot you. That's why we couldn't do anything. She didn't know what to do, so she called her husband Yusuf, now thousands of miles away in London. It was also a nightmare for me as well, because I was in quarantine hotel. I couldn't do anything. And uh, my husband said, I will speak with someone and they will enter you to the airport. When I talked to them, we have three people. They say, OK, you have to pay us. $9,000. I said, I don't have that much money, it's too much. What's wrong with you? <laughs> but finally, I think they decided 5000 to everyone, they will take 5000 And after that, there was a man, and, and they come, they told me, come with us and we will take you to the right place. On that day, Taliban make a good amount of money. People give them cars and say, take this, take me in. To get uh, into the airport, uh, they bribe people, yeah. They take a good, good amount of money yeah, to just take you through there. The Taliban have denied these claims of extortion and say they want to set themselves up as a legitimate government. And they didn't do anything. They just took us to the door and they said, you can go inside. And when I go there, there was also like shooting and they were putting spray on people. The Ministry of Defence says UK armed forces did not use CS gas grenades during the evacuations and did not even fire warning shots at that time. It was like uh, join all the military. There was no space to, to see which side is which military. But uh, someone told me at that time, uh, keep your passport safe and if they put spray, that your passport will be damaged. When I saw the UK, uh, I just... Uh, um, uh, up my hand and I told them, excuse me, excuse me, sir, and he looked at me. He said, show your face and your passport, and then he said, you can follow me. He was other side of the fence and I was this side, the Afghan side. There was a small wall and it was a little bit hard because I had also angel leg as well. First of all, they took my daughter to go. The military helped me and I couldn't even jump. And, <laughs> and I put my hand on the military's hand and just jumped there. And after that, my nephew come. That was the safe place. They said, don't worry, don't worry, this is a safe place. Inside there was a uh, very mess up and uh, dirty place. We was uh, like two o'clock we entered to that uh, place. Until 12 o'clock night we were standing on the queue. There was a lot of like uh, searching and then we entered there. There was like stones, not any space to sitting, like car parking. 1.30 at night, uh, my daughter, she was trying to sleep and then I found a cardboard and put it on the floor, on the stones and put the bag under her head and took out my clothes and put on top. When it's night, then it was so cold. When it's day, then it was so hot. We were trying to sit with each other very closely and we will get like um, warm, but we couldn't. My mom gave me everything. She say everything's fine. We keep going. If we go back to home, then it will be so hard for us. And you have to go only forward. Eventually, they were taken inside the airport complex proper. 
10 o'clock they call us to come to the queue, another queue. But there was very sunny and getting hot. And after one hour, my daughter, she become sick. She just lay, uh, lay down on the floor. And uh, uh, even my, my sleeves, uh, which was out of my hijab, it got sunburned. And then they called the doctor. They didn't give any medication, but they said, we will bring you food. They tried to bring food, but uh, the people who was on the front, they just snatched it, yeah, and took all the food, fruits, everything. Two days and two nights, we didn't uh, eat anything. Third day, morning time, someone gave us like that much. One lady, she brought uh, bread from her, her house and she gave it to us. And just I gave it to my nephew and daughter because they were children. I was thinking they might, I have the, you know, the strength to keep myself hungry, but not them. My mom was sleeping on the ground. Yeah, like sit and sleep. Then I think she dream uh, she's eating. Then he, uh, she did like <laughs> She was so hungry. She say I dreamed I eating the rice. I eating the rice and she did like um <laughs> And then another night come. Until morning eight o'clock. That was our turn and the immigration officer spoke to us and, and then they said okay, you are allowed to go in with the two kids. And then they put a number on our hand like um, 3,000 or something. They said, this is your ticket, don't remove it. Uh, yeah, and uh, we try to keep it safe until the UK. Still outside the Baron Hotel is Afsal, the 35-year-old who had worked with the British military. He's battling to get inside the heavily fortified gates. By now, he's worked out that the only way to leave is to get inside the hotel and enter the processing system. If he doesn't get in, he may never be able to go. When the cable fall down, we skip to behind the airport. There was many people on the account entered to the airport. After a few days, when I entered the airport, I meet Alex. He was a leader of the British group in the Baron Hotel. He say, yeah, you need to go to UK and you can't call your family. While Afzal and his son are where they need to be, the rest of his family still have to get to the airport. But if he goes to get them, he may struggle to get back. When they come near to the gate, they can't enter to the gate and I, I uh, move back out to bring my family inside. I can't enter back to the airport and the people push me and I said my, my son was inside the airport, the hotel with my friends and with Alex and I was being with my family outside the airport and we received a message to go out from uh, behind the door because we received some trade. Afzal's family are now separated from his son and things are about to get worse. Huge explosion, mass casualties, people rush to hospital. Chaotic scenes in the midst of a chaotic evacuation. For days there had been security warnings that a suicide attack was imminent at Kabul airport. The sheer number of people, the lack of checks, the absence of metal detectors and the knowledge that Islamic State were actively operating in the capital all added up to a frightening reality that an attack could happen at any time. In the midst of the thousands, a suicide bomber struck in the sewage canal between the Baron Hotel and the Abbey Gate entrance to the airport. It's no more than a couple of hundred metres apart. At least 170 Afghans were killed, along with 13 American Marines. I worried about my son. Any times when I spoke with him, he was crying. And that's no good for me and for my wife. And at the same time, my small daughter, she was crying in here. We lost him as well. As well as being separated from his son, Avzal's daughter has now gone missing. She's been abducted. They tipped my daughter. My son was inside the Baron Hotel. I was with my family outside. My small daughter, the Taliban, took for three hours. When I ask all the people, please, my daughter, I lost my daughter. A young boy, he told me that guy 
I saw him. He took the small girl with him, but I know him. He has a shop in here, and he moved to this way. When I went to that man and I told him, "You took my daughter," he said, "Okay," and he told his son, "Go and bring his daughter." When he went about twenty minutes, they say, "Okay." Follow us. My wife, she was crying. She said, "My daughter's. Oh, we lost my daughter." The man told her son, "Take some things, and we call in Afghanistan like shirini, bribery. Yeah, take some money, and I put that money to their son' pocket, and we received the daughter." When I saw my daughter, my, my daughter, she no cry, and she just she like this. Avzal had finally got his daughter back, but now the family were outside the airport and stuck in the chaotic crowds again. He managed to make contact with the British officer who had helped him earlier. After twenty-five hours or thirty hours, Alex was. Find way, and they put ladders and the wall, because on that time entering to the airport was impossible. Me with my family, we entered to the airport. Everything was against us. Just the people help us. We never forgot that. Back with Shabano. After three days and two nights, she, her daughter, and her nephew were finally about to board their plane. Ten o'clock, we went to the airplane. Yeah, it was uh, not the normal airplane. It was military airplane. It was so big, and we have to go in one line in. And they said the woman who was pregnant with the kids or uh, disabled people on the seat, and other people all on the floor. And they, there were just like specific places they like sign it one for one one person. And we don't have any space to like move or anything. It was like pretty the chair. A long uh, things to hold mm -hmm. on the floor like this. We have to hold it like this. Then I was tired. Then I. Like leave it, and I was go backward. <laughs> like I was scream. The hardest uh, thing was when it was taking off. I was feeling like there was no oxygen, and uh, all the people was feeling sick. I tried to sleep and put my head on my daughter's tummy, but when I wake up, I see all the people was like unconscious, even the children, and they were trying to put water on top of it and. The military was trying to help them. So I was thinking it is like uh, you know the nightmare. She was missing from me, from for nine hours. She couldn't answer WhatsApp, direct call, email. I try all things. Her brothers over there, my brothers are trying to contact her, and I was so worried. <laughs> Normally she would contact me on WhatsApp. But on that time, I was checking every second mobile. I said, "Come on, give me one text, please." So just a sign that where you are, you are in Dubai, you are in Kabul, you are in other country. What should I do? Who should I contact? And after that, we went to Dubai for six hours, and then it was commercial flight, Emirates, and uh, it was very good flight. <laughs> and and even we were coming here, we didn't know. That we will go to London or Birmingham or Manchester somewhere, but when we enter to to the airplane, then there was like announcing this flight is going to London. Then after that, I told them that now we are safe. And then suddenly I receive a message on my Facebook, and I see she was uh, her name. I said yes. <laughs> so then I was so happy and so excited, and she was. Very tired and devastated, and uh, she said, "I'm here. I'm fine. The kids are okay. Uh, we all are tired and very, very tired." And then I say, "Oh, thanks God." <laughs> They're heading to the UK with one small bag of hand luggage, but what awaits? 
In the next episode of Out of Afghanistan, families tell us their experience of starting a completely new life. Out of Afghanistan is a Sky News podcast produced by Anne-Marie Bullock and presented by me, Stuart Ramsey. Archive is by Simon Windsor and sound design by Will Chalk. The editor is Paul Stamworth.